Um, let's look at what we're going to talk about over the course of the next 45 minutes. I want to make sure we have time for questions at the end. Um, the first thing we're going to do is talk about why are we fundraising? You may be thinking we need money. Um, of course, that's why we're fundraising, but uh, we're going to get into more than that. Um, and then we're going to look a little bit at some data that's essential when we think about fundraising at year end, metrics that you want to think about for your ministry, tactics that MMFA recommends for you to consider before the end of the year, and then finally we'll talk a little bit about next steps. So here we go, end of year fundraising essential. First of all, why are we fundraising? I know some of you joined the stewardship webinar that MMFA offered in August, so this will be familiar for, with you, but in case you weren't there, uh, and to give those of you that heard it before an overview, um, you know uh, Simon Sinek uh, gave a TED Talk back in 2010 uh, that's been viewed over 60 million times since, and it's called Start With The Why, How Great Leaders Inspire Action. And in the talk, and then later in a book, Simon presents this concept of the golden circle, which is nothing complicated. He drew it just uh, as you see here. But why is at the middle? And Simon says that this is important because too often as ministries, we, we know what we do and we're good at communicating about that. We can ask people for money for the what that we're doing. Uh, but the why is what really gets people to act and to want to be engaged with our ministry. So put your why at the center. This is the core purpose of your organization, the reason behind why you do what you do and why people should care about you, why they should give to your organization between now and December 31st. Um, people's gifts to you matter because they're supporting that why. So put that why front and center of any of your solicitations, your communications on your website. Um, this, is, this is common practice all the time, not just for end of year fundraising. Um, make sure that you've got that why anchored uh, in the middle of everything that you're doing. Let's look at a real example. We're going to look at Tricklebee Cafe, which if you're not familiar with Tricklebee, it's a okay as you can cafe uh, in Milwaukee, uh, Ministry of the Moravian Church. And their website really clearly states their why. So let's look at what they say. Um, they're talking about seeking to be a peaceful gathering place and a safe inviting place for neighbors and working to eliminate prejudice and discrimination and how they do that. So when I read this, I know Trickleby is a pay-as-you-can cafe. I don't see a lot about we serve meals or any specifics around that what. I, I read the why, and I think my money is helping to create peace, it's helping to create safety, and it's helping to create community. So that's their why that's spelled out in those three paragraphs. Um, and people connect deeply with that why behind their work. So I love this example straight from a Moravian ministry of anchoring messaging in the why. Um, let's look again at the circle and talk about the other two pieces that are important. You see the how. Um, this is the process that describes how you achieve your why, the actions that your ministry is taking um, when you're living out of your why. It's uh, how you're bringing that why to life. It's what makes your organization unique, and that combination of how and why is a little bit, think of it like your organizational fingerprint. So if we are thinking about Trickle B, um, their how that they achieve peace and community, et cetera, might be that they prohibit guns in the restaurant. Uh, their how might be that they're hiring staff that's diverse and reflective of the community, and they're making sure that folks have been trained in, in inclusivity and tolerance and that kind of thing. Um, and we know one of their hows is that they go out into the neighborhood to meet folks and be in relationship with them rather than waiting for those folks to come in their door for a meal. So those might be some of the hows that Trickle B would articulate. And then finally, there at the edge of the what. Again, we are all good as ministries to talk about what we do. Um, products and services are the sort of basics for that. And I think all of you know your what and probably communicate really well about it. Uh, but again, things that are going to inspire folks to be generous between now and the end of the year, especially, are messages around your why. Um, again, if we want to talk about trickle beta to close the loop, uh, so to speak, their what is healthy meals, food service training, and spiritual offerings. And that's clear on their website, too, what we do. Um, but they also, again, recognize the simple truth that if people aren't giving to the what, 
they're giving to the why. Uh, so our essential number one, as we think about fundraising, is to know your why and to invite generosity to that. Second item on our agenda this morning is some data. I could overload you with data and we could spend a whole hour on fundraising data. So I tried to just pull two different um, pieces that I think are important and we will talk about why they are important, of course. So you all are familiar with Giving USA. Every year uh, they release uh, all kinds of helpful numbers around uh, charitable giving in the United States. And so here's their graph from their latest report through 2023. Uh, and if you would like a copy of this report and you don't have it, I'd be happy to get it to you. Um, so you we're looking at giving to religion over time since they started doing this uh, research. And you see two lines here. Encouraging news is that current dollars are up over time. You see that inflation adjusted dollars where the giving remains pretty flat, uh, at least from this year to last year. Um, but when we look at the current dollars being given to religious organizations, that's churches, that's church camps, that's schools that are affiliated with religions, the Catholic schools, all different kinds of schools, they're all lumped in um, as, as in the religious sector. Uh, but the growth in religion between 2022 and 2023 was 3.1%, which is encouraging news. That was an estimated $145.81 billion. Um, and then uh, if we look more long-term than that, um, if we look at current dollar giving to religion from 2021 to 2023, it increased 7.8%. So, uh, and the other really great piece of data that's not represented in this graph is that the, this, our sector, the religious sector, gets by far the highest total number of donations compared to any other sector uh, for the last five years even. So why does this data matter to you all as fundraisers in the religious space? Uh, we hear a lot of news about decline in numbers, don't we? In our churches, there's fewer people in the pews on Sunday morning, uh, and it can be easy to think um, with that, that news that we should see a decline in dollars, and you may have even seen a decline in dollars in your particular setting, but research shows that people are continuing to grow in their giving to religious uh, organizations, and so we have to continue to ask. We have to continue to invite generosity, um, and this, this, to me, this graph is encouraging news. And then the second thing that I want you to consider, hopefully you're able to see it, um, this comes from um, Givelify's Giving and Faith Report uh, 2024. Uh, again, we'll be happy to share that with you if you're interested in it. But they asked people of faith who were giving to their churches who also gave to other nonprofits how they made those gifts. Um, and you'll see that big bar there at the very top is through the organization's website. 57% of the people in this survey made a gift to another nonprofit utilizing that nonprofit's website. So obvious reason why this matters, your website needs to be informative, it needs to be inspirational, it's gotta have your why. Um, so if you haven't spent some time looking at your ministry's website in a while, good thing to do before you start asking for money between now and the end of the year. Um, and you can use MMFA's giving portal. If you think, gosh, our site's not an easy place for folks to make gifts, if you're not already using the portal, we hope that you'll use the portal. We'll talk a little bit about that as next steps. But again, interesting data around how people are from this particular survey were making gifts, and it was through the organization's, organization's website. So make sure your website reflects who you are, what you do, and why you do it. Let's look up for a minute at some metrics, some things that are important for you to be keeping an eye on before you start asking for money between now and the end of the year. Do you know your organization's average gift, the average amount given from year to year to your ministry? And I would encourage you to kind of segment that average. Look at all of your donors in a year, look at your first time donor average, and then look at your existing donor average and do a little bit of comparison between these. Um, it helps you see trends over time. And it's also interesting, I think, to see our new donors giving more than existing donors. They shouldn't be, but if you find that they are, that tells you I need to do some work with my existing donors to steward them better. Um, so really uh, start with that average gift. It's usually the easiest one to calculate. And, and really drill into those numbers a little bit um, and try to go back several years. We're far enough, quote unquote, beyond the 2020 time of COVID uh, where these numbers should be relevant and help you set some goals going forward. So look at that average gift. 
Also, look at your change in revenue and uh, track it against both the consumer price index as well as the average for our sector. And I can, I can provide you those numbers as well. Why is that worth your time? Um, it's important to try to keep pace with costs, the cost of fundraising. Um, there is an expense to any efforts you're putting into asking folks to give to your ministry. So this helps you see that. Um, as well as being aware of the growth uh, of other religious sector uh, nonprofits. Unfortunately, the Moravian Church is not a denomination where it's easy to be able to say, hey, here's what the average Moravian ministry that's this size, um, the revenue, those numbers are not ones that we share as a denomination. Um, but I still think there's some ways that you can, again, pay attention to your change in revenue from year to year and track it against those two different spaces uh, to give you some uh, clarity around your goals as you're uh, fundraising. Third metric that I think is of value for you all is your donor file uh, growth score. What does that mean? That means take your donors that you've added, those are brand new gifts, first time gifts, and then anybody that was reactivated. Um, and so that is somebody who gave last, uh, has given in the past, hadn't given and then gave again and then you're dividing them by your donors lost. Those are your folks who gave last year, but they haven't given this year. Um, so any score of less than one means that your donor file is shrinking. So again, you're looking at folks that you've added in 2024, both brand new and folks that you reactivated, um, and then you're, all, you're dividing them by the number that you've lost who haven't given um, to determine what your growth file score is. Why does this matter? Again, it's helping you clarify your efforts um, we know it takes time to acquire a donor, a lot of time. Um, it's typically easier to retain a donor, so important to pay attention to how many folks did I lose? Um, is it kind of an even? I acquired as many new as I lost. So it's just a way for you to look at your efforts and see what's working and maybe where you want to add some um, additional steps. And we'll, we'll tie our tactics into some of these metrics so that you can see how, how they play out for you as fundraisers. And then finally, and the fourth and uh, last of our essential metrics is uh, donor retention. I mentioned that just now. So there's two ways to look at this, of course. You can look at your new donor retention. Those are folks that were new for your ministry last year, who's given again this year, dividing that number by your 2023 new donors for your new donor retention rate. And then you can do it for your existing folks as well. Again, this takes time and you may already be thinking, Laura, I don't have time to do all this. Um, I think that average gift metric, the very first one we talked about, uh, is important for you if you can't do all four of these. I think donor retention is really important. We count a lot in the church on loyalty, don't we? we and we've got a generation sitting in the pews that are very loyal, and they're loyal not just to their church, but they're loyal to Border World Mission and Music Foundation and all, all, all kinds of Moravian ministries, church camps. Um, but we can't behave in a way that uh, assumes everyone's going to be loyal. And so if you're paying attention to your retention rate and factoring it in as you set goals, uh, that's a step towards success between now and the end of the year. Before we get into tactics, I always like to insert a little bit of cartoon humor in MMFA webinars about uh, generosity. This comes um, from cartoonchurch.com. I think it must be maybe uh, perhaps a, a non, it's not a Moravian uh, slant on it, but you see sort of the idea generator. If only it was this easy uh, that we identify who's gonna do something, what are they doing, how long are they doing it? And there's something silly that they're gonna do while they do it. I love singing all the hymns. Um, and then you're encouraging people to an action. So sometimes, though, there is a formula to fundraising, and it does look a little bit like this cartoon. Um, and this may spark an idea for you, but just wanted to have a, a little bit, a little moment of levity before we get into some tactics. Okay, so let's look at four different essential tactics for you to consider between now and the end of the year. And you see here a picture of uh, the dwellings mobile shower ministry. The dwelling is a federated mission between the Lutheran Church and the Raven Church here in Winston-Salem, uh, and they offer showers for folks that need them. Uh, a lot of the people that are utilizing this service are people who are experiencing homelessness. So you see that picture of their shower ministry. So again, as we talked before about putting your why in the middle of everything that you're doing, the first tactic I want you to consider is why messaging, making sure that why is part of what you say to folks as you ask them to support your ministry. 
So for a ministry like The Dwelling, um, their why might say, or their, their basic fundraising might be, with $250, we can provide showers for 30 to 40 guests. Um, if you've done fundraising training in the past, you know, and you were taught to say exactly how much money does what for your ministry. So here's that formula in action, 250 bucks, tells me as a potential donor exactly what's going to happen. 30 to 40 people are going to get a shower in a day. And that sounds really great. That is a powerful what, and it lets me know exactly what my money is doing. However, if the dwelling were to consider putting why into their messaging, they might say $250 provides showers for 30 to 40 guests. So again, you're still making sure people know exactly what that dollar amount is doing and the impact it's having. So you've got that specific service, the what, but then you're giving people an outcome. What happens as a result of my gift? Somebody uh, is healthier. They've been able to take a shower and they're clean and hopefully, or if any germs and all of the things that might be on them have been washed away. So I've got an outcome in mind now as I think about my gift to the dwelling. And finally, the real why and the oomph in this is the you create healing and dignity. So one of the dwellings why, why this ministry exists is to create healing and dignity for people experiencing homelessness. And so it's there. And it's telling me that with my gift, I create that. That's a really powerful fundraising appeal. It's important always to be connecting with your donor. You do this so that they feel like this is a transformational experience. Donors long for that. Research shows us that people don't just want that transactional, I gave you 50 bucks, but they're longing for a connection and a transformative experience. And this language is very transformative from the dwelling. Our second essential tactic to think about is transforming your communications. And we're going to look at doing that two ways. Again, so much of fundraising can be transactional if we're not careful. Um, typically, again, there's that formula of donor made a gift. We say thank you. We update them on our work a few months later, perhaps, and then we're careful not to ask for money yet. We wait, and then we ask for money again. It's a cycle that a lot of nonprofits fall into, understandably, but again, studies show us that people are giving because they feel a connection with that why, um, and they want to see that uh, play out in your communications. Your mission is transformational. You know that. That's why you love the work that you do and being part of your ministry. Um, so make sure you're having a transformative relationship with your donors. So one way to start is with the language that you're using, simple word shift. So you might say in an average appeal, give now. Um, give is a great word. That's what you want them to do. Open up your wallet, right? Um, but consider using the word partner. Partner with us today. Um, that's much more of a transformational invitation than that transaction of give. Let's look at a few more. Donate. Again, that's what we want. We all know it. Um, but think about that word invest. Invest with us as part of the language that you're using. It used to be that we avoided using the word invest because we didn't want people to think we were talking literally about investment stocks, that kind of thing. Um, but more and more, this language has saturated the industry where invest means giving of time, giving of talent, giving of yourself. And it's that transformative invitation. So consider uh, that simple language shift. Uh, and then a final one is uh, moving away from using support us, support our work to collaborate with us. Now, don't do that if you're not going to then work on stewarding that relationship with your donors. You can't invite someone to collaborate with you and then shut them out as soon as they've given you the donation that you are hoping for. Um, but I think that word collaborate is one of the trend words for fundraising and development work in 2024 and beyond. I'm sure you're seeing it and hearing it in all kinds of spaces, um, but it's working for people in, in terms of folks are longing for that. They want to collaborate with organizations whose work is impactful and whose why is meaningful for them. And then our second transformation to think about is the looks and lengths of your communications. So what does this mean? If you typically communicate with your folks, maybe with a monthly e-newsletter, and it has a template that you utilize, make sure if you're going to uh, do some appeals and some fundraising that those emails look different. Uh, brain research shows us people get accustomed to seeing information in a certain format, 
And if it keeps coming to them that way, they don't pay as much attention to it because they presume it's what they're used to. So you want any ask for money, uh, any invitation to partner, invest, or collaborate to look really different. So maybe switch to a postcard style format or um, the envelopes that open, it looks like the cards coming out even. So look into some options that would make your emails look very different from how they normally look. Um, again, if you're used to sending sort of long form style messages, consider shortening them, maybe just having a powerful photo with a link to some content on your website, because we've already learned that donors are making gifts through websites. Um, those that were the faith based in that study that we looked at earlier. Um, so drive people to your site as you're inviting them to give. Um, I, I really do think, again, a change in the look and the feel of your communications is telling your audience, hey, this is something different and they're going to pay attention, um, especially when there's a powerful photo that's, that's utilized, uh, visuals that people weren't expecting outside the norm. Okay, third tactic, and we're going to spend a little bit more time here because there are a lot of different ways to approach this, is to create a sense of urgency. All the time in our churches, we know, uh, if we're involved in stewardship, that people tend to give more when there's a crisis, right? Um, so how can we harness that human behavior as much as it may frustrate us, especially those of you that are pastors, uh, as much as it may be frustrating, uh, we can harness that to, to create a sense of urgency even when there's not a crisis happening in our organization. So the first way that you can do this is uh, see if there is a matching donor, somebody who will match gifts made to your organization. This is a common tactic at the end of the year. So I may be considering giving $100 to Mount Morris between now and the end of the year. But if I saw that Mount Morris had a donor that was going to match all gifts up to a certain amount or however the, they structured that match, it would hit me, gosh, my $100 is going to become $200. That's a no-brainer. And I'm much more likely to make that guess because I know it's going to be doubled. That's a common um, common way to do it. So is there somebody, and it, it, a lot of donors will say I'll match gifts up to a certain amount. Um, is there somebody that's willing to do that for your organization between now and the end of the year or for a shorter time period, too? Another way to do that, if you're working with a special people who feel really deeply about your ministry, uh, is to see what kind of challenge they would like to issue. So we worked with somebody uh, at MMFA several years ago from Raving Day of Giving who said that they wanted to, for every new gift that came in on Day of Giving, they wanted to give. $10 up to a certain amount. So again, you may be thinking, gosh, we'd really like to get some new gifts, expand our donor uh, network. So that might be a way to issue that to folks that have been considering giving to your ministry but haven't done it yet. Um, or another challenge might be for every recurring gift that's set up in 2025, we've got a donor that's going to make a contribution, a certain amount, however they want to structure it. That's common too. Um, I would say all of us for, as fundraisers should have the goal of getting more recurring gifts to our organization. So again, you may look at your donor segments and say, hey, I've got these people that every year are giving $100 for the last five years, $100 a year. I can count on them for that. Maybe they're the ideal target market to say, hey, if you would consider setting up a recurring gift of $10 a month, $20 a month, whatever, it's already more than they're giving once a year, but not so much more that it's uncomfortable. We've got a donor that's issued a challenge and is going to make a $10 gift per referring, recurring gift that gets set up between now and December 31st. Again, it takes having those special people with capacity, you having a relationship with them, being able to talk to them about this. Um, but there's high levels of success with these kinds of approaches, especially at year end. Third thing to think about to create a sense of urgency is, of course, a 24-hour fundraiser. Set a goal. 24 hours, we're trying to make this much. Um, I would su suggest that you consider, if you decide maybe to do this on a day in November, look at how much your ministry received in that comparable time frame in years past. Over the month of November, how much typically comes in, let's say. And then say in 24 hours, what would be a realistic goal for you to hit based off that total amount for the month? So that doesn't mean divide by 20, uh, by the number of days in the month, by 30, um, but it needs to be a stretch, but something that you think that you could achieve. And then go all in on saying, hey, we're trying to do this fundraising blitz, everybody in on this day, uh, and build some momentum around those 24 hours. Again, it creates that sort of sense of, I've got to act now, um, whereas you may have people that are sitting there kind of waiting and they haven't made decisions yet about giving. And then finally, we're back to some language uh, choices. You see these words immediately and instantly. So those automatically imply a sense of urgency. 
Um, we are wired for instant gratification, right? Amazon Prime is giving us stuff the next day if we order it uh, oftentimes. So we're taking actions online and we are expecting results right away. Uh, most of the times our ministries are good online giving. You made a gift, you get an email right away. So channel this aspect of your fundraising into that sense of urgency by tweaking it a little bit. We're going to look at a specific example um, for Unity Women's Death, which is a global ministry of the Moravian Church. So two ways that they could do this is to say, when you invest in our ministry, you'll instantly receive a profile of one of the women whose lives have been changed by your generosity. So inviting people to give and letting them know you're instantly going to get this story about somebody whose life has been impacted by the person's donation. Another way they could do it is to say, immediately partner with us, do it now by giving to end violence against women and we'll instantly send you a video from our coordinator in Uganda. So again, they're taking specific, a specific aspect of the work that they do that's really, really important and impactful that they know folks respond to. And they're letting me know as a donor, if I make a gift, I'm going to get an email with a link to a video and that's appealing to me because I care about this work, right? So again, they've used instantly and immediately in these appeals and uh, people respond to that sense of urgency when uh, it's paired with the invitation to give. And our final tactic is going to be part A and part B. Um, you see peer to peer here. What does that mean? Uh, simply, it's just a way to get your supporters to raise money for you within their networks um, at its most basic level. So why does this matter? Why is it important? Well, we know people give to people. Uh, if there's somebody on your board who's really passionate about the work that you do and they tell somebody else about it and invite them to give too, there's a greater chance of success than if you possibly an unknown were to solicit that potential donor. Think of all the times that you have given because a coworker's child was jump roping for the Heart Association or um, you saw somebody running a birthday campaign on Facebook and it was a, a nonprofit that you liked the mission or you loved the person whose birthday it was, right? That's peer-to-peer -peer fundraising and people give to people. So work the people who know you and love you uh, as you think about fundraising between now and the end of the year. Um, second reason why peer-to-peer -peer is really effective is it helps you expand your network. Um, you're reaching people that you don't know because you're, it's your folks moving in their circles. And you see that diagram there, which comes uh, off the Giving Tuesday site, which we'll talk about here a little bit in the middle. So you've got folks in the middle that are organizing, and they're, they're pushing out to their peers, their networks, their folks that they know care about the, the kind of work that you do uh, to invite them to be generous. So it's helping you without, with very little work on your part, you're expanding the network for your nonprofit or for your ministry. Um, and then finally, peer-to-peer -peer is ideal for small organizations with limited staff for fundraising. And I think as we looked at the registration list for this <laughs> webinar, both today at noon and tonight, we know that everybody that's here is part of a small organization with limited staff for fundraising. Um, so this is perfect because you're not having to invest a lot of your time and your energy into making this a success. Once you get it organized and, and get your, your lead ambassadors, your lead cheerleaders, your lead supporters involved, they're going to do the work for you. So it doesn't take a lot of your time. Again, it's not an investment of money either because we know fundraising does have a cost. So it's a low cost uh, investment for you as well. And there's also tons of free resources for peer-to-peer -peer fundraising available online. Um, and then there's specific days, of course, that you can harness for peer-to-peer, -peer, one of those being Giving Tuesday. So let's look at that one in particular. I feel like anyone has to be familiar with Giving Tuesday, but just in case you're not, it's December 3rd. It's always the Tuesday after Thanksgiving. It's a global generosity day. Uh, and if you get on their website, which is givingtuesday.org, they've got all kinds of uh, resources. Hannah's going to pop a specific link into the chat if she hasn't done so already so that you'll um, be able to access what they've got easily. They have all kinds of tools specifically for nonprofits, and then they even have them for faith-based organizations as well. So Giving Tuesday as a peer-to-peer -peer fundraiser is brilliant for you. Again, you're amplifying voices. Everybody pretty much knows about Giving Tuesday, and I imagine is making a gift somewhere on that day. So there's all these voices that are out there on social media talking about it, um, and it's a chance for you to get all your people buzzing about you on this one specific day. Another reason, and this is a reason that motivates Moravians to give when we survey our donors on Moravian Day of Giving, 
a lot of people, this is their why for making their gift on Day of Giving. They like that collective accomplishment. What can we do together if we all give on this one day to this particular organization? So think about uh, what that could look like for your organization. If you've done any kind of Giving Tuesday campaign in the past or even just a 24-hour one or a short-term one, um, look at what you were able to accomplish in the past and determine whether you want to factor that into to what you invite people into this year. Um, if you've raised before in a short period of time $5,000, let's say, you might say to folks, let's collectively, we, can we do 6000 this year, that kind of thing, because Moravians like the fact that we're in relationship with one another and that we can do big things together um, when we come put Put our, put our minds to it and our wallets to it too. So collective accomplishments really important. Um, again, there's tons of free resources to help you. I was overwhelmed uh, the first time I looked at Giving Tuesday's site just to see what all was out there for, for our nonprofits and our, and our faith-based folks specifically. Um, so take advantage of those. There's toolkits, uh, again, with marketing messaging and templates and planners and all kinds of things. Um, and I think even beyond Giving Tuesday, they give you, if you need a fresh way to look at your fundraising efforts as you, you position into 2025, it gives you some smart ways to do that because um, those planning templates are invaluable uh, for the fundraising efforts. All right, let's look at some next steps. And then I want to make sure we've got plenty of time for uh, questions and answers and conversations. I've got some questions for you all if you don't have any for us. Um, always, you're going to get an email. It's going to have the slides that we've looked at today, a uh, recording of the webinar, and then the key points from it. We know, uh, especially if you will be so gracious to share this with your board or folks that you think need to, to be aware of this information, they may not have time to listen to the whole recorded webinar. So we'd like to provide those key points that you can share with your folks as well. I uh, we'll want you to spend some time assessing your fundraising efforts past year end efforts. If you've specifically tried things last year in the final quarter of the year, how did that turn out? Um, if you haven't done specific year-end sort of campaigns, just general fundraising successes, is your ministry one that uh, sees a lot of response when you have a certain event um, or certain people speak up? Whatever, whatever has worked for you in the past, is that something you want to build on for this year? Always recommend that you do. Uh, factoring in some of these tactics that we've talked about and tweaking things a little bit. Um, think about your current capacity. We often know end of year equals uh, holidays, it equals Advent, a very important time for our church. Um, so we tend to want to be careful with how we navigate that space. Um, so again, think about timing and wh what's the right fit for you, when to do what. Um, I'm in no way suggesting that you have to do everything that we've talked about today. Um, so you may only have capacity to do one thing, do that one thing really, really well. Um, determine, look at your folks that are giving to your ministry. Is there somebody that you think would love the chance to be a matching donor or a donor that issues a specific kind of challenge to your folks? Um, I know typically when I talk to people about doing this, there's a lot of hesitancy um, and it's not something that everybody feels comfortable doing. But on the receiving end, when we talk to people who've been matching donors, and we had matching donors for every single one of our grant making funds this past year of Day of Giving, they all loved that they got to do it. It was a thrill for them to be able to be generous in that way and to see how they, their generosity was encouraging people to give to a fund that they'd never given to before. Um, so I would say don't be afraid. Uh, if you think it will damage a relationship, certainly you don't want to do it. Um, but if your only reason for holding back is just sort of your own fear and discomfort, um, Think a little bit about that and see what you can do to overcome it. And I'm always happy to have a one-on-one -on -one talk uh, to kind of coach about having these kinds of conversations with people. Um, other thing for you to think about as you're assessing is, um, oh, and your board, start with your board. You've got a group of people that are your, your biggest leaders, right? You're in theory, your biggest champion. So they are the low hanging fruit as you consider potential donors to do a match or a challenge. Uh, then do some planning. Um, you've thought about your capacity, the right fit for you between now and the end of the year, what you think might lead to the to the um, success that you're looking for, and start your plan. When are you going to do what? Make sure you've got your why clear. Get that on your website. Get it on your social media. Get it on in any kind of communications you're pushing out. And then decide what's the right way for me to reach the audience I'm trying to reach. Maybe you've got a group you want to reach with some digital communication. Maybe you've got a group that you know I've got to always send print to these folks. 
Um, so be thoughtful around who you're asking, uh, when you're going to ask them, and how you're going to ask them. We always encourage, this gets back to capacity and what, what you have the ability to do if you've got a small staff or no staff that's doing fundraising, um, but we always encourage people to segment their audiences because not every group responds to the same message the same way. Again, I'm happy to provide some, some further thought around that for your particular ministry and what might work best for you. Um, be thinking about, do you want to try to do a 24-hour type fundraiser? Do you want to benefit from Giving Tuesday and the momentum that already exists for that global generosity day? That kind of thing. Um, if you're considering any kind of peer-to-peer -peer effort, have conversations with those folks um, and see what they think the plan should be and how what they've got capacity for and, and invite them into the planning. Um, some people will ask, are the people I should be talking to my top donors? Um, I would say most of the time, yes, but you've also got people that are very loyal. You know them. They show up for everything. They respond to things. Um, they're the people that are frequently in your inbox uh, in a positive way, talking to you about what's going on with your ministry and what you're up to. Um, they may only be giving $10 a year. It doesn't matter. The size of the gift doesn't matter because you know their commitment to your ministry is huge. So I would definitely include them as well uh, as you're thinking about your plan between the offerings. I mentioned our portal earlier. I think everybody that's on here is aware of the portal. Uh, $100 given through the portal to your ministry is $100 to your ministry. MFA covers all those fees. If you are not pushing the portal in front of your folks, let's talk about why. Um, again, sometimes we talk to ministries who have concerns about people don't understand what MFA does or they want to. we want to keep everybody on our site, understandable. Um, but this could be an opportunity for you if you're doing a 24-hour fundraiser or Giving Tuesday, whatever, um, utilize the portal and 100% of any gift given is going to come straight to you. So uh, we hope that you'll learn more about that if you don't already know about it. Um, those of you that are all in on the portal on the call, thank you for that. Um, hope that you're able to see the impact of getting this gift 100%. Um, and then finally, don't ever go it alone. Again, I have worked at Laurel Ridge where we did not have a staff for fundraising. That was me. Um, and you've got a lot of other stuff on your plate. Uh, as pastors, as leaders in your ministries uh, and in your organizations. So don't go it alone. Let MMFA help. Um, it, it is my job to help you. So uh, it's free of charge. So give me a call, send me an email, um, and let me know what you're thinking. Um, if you walk away from today's webinar just feeling completely overwhelmed and how am I going to fit anything in between now and December 31st, it's only three-ish months away. Um, Hannah reminded me yesterday, only 100 days till Christmas, now it's 99. Um, so it feels a little bit like a clock is just ticking down really quickly. Um, don't go it alone. Let MMFA help. Utilize our website, MMFA.com. There's resources there. We're in the midst of a, a rework of it, so it's about to be way better than it is today. Um, but please, please, please call, email, and, and let us know how we can assist you with these efforts between now and the end of the year. All right, I'm going to stop my, sh my screen share, invite you all uh, to ask any questions that you've got. Um, and if not, I do have a couple questions for you. Let me just stop sharing. And Hannah, if you don't mind stopping recording, that would be great.